My message today, as it's the same title as it has been, I think, for the last four weeks on the Revelation, is the spiritual decline of the churches. Now, one thing I left off my notes, and it's my fault, not Tyler's, I left off what each of the four churches were, uh, what the climb was, and lost their first love, and uh, brought in worldly things in church, brought in idols and uh, immorality and all that. Uh, so today we're going to study the church of Sardis. Uh, the introduction, Sardis was built about 1,500 feet above the valley floor which would be called a citadel. And it was fortified for safety. It was up on a hill and was hard to get to. Usually unable to be destroyed, captured, or even broken into. It was prominent as the kingdom of Lindia Kingdom. The prominent business was gathering wool and dyeing it, producing clothing and other items made of wool. Asop, a famous author, came from Sardis, and the tradition says Melito, a member of the church of Sardis, wrote his, the first commentary of parts of Revelation. The church of Sardis had grown cold and dead and was basically filled with unredeemed, unregenerated members. Like many churches today, we have a lot of people that are members, but they're not Christians. So, slide number one. Revelation 3, 3.1a. To the angel of church of Sardis write. It's the first part of that verse. He who has seven spirits of God and seven stars says this, I know your deeds that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. They were alive. They, they knew what was going on around them, but they were dead in Christ. They were unregenerated. Many in the church were unregenerated. They were not following Christ. Um, in that same passage, it, it talks about the seven lampstands. Um, he who has the, this, the verse actually says, He who has the Spirit of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, and you are alive, but you are dead. Uh, the seven lampstands is a description of the menorah as the Holy Spirit. Also, it's a number, it's uh, in Zechariah, it's the number of completeness, which is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, both of these passages are believed to be what that is. There's two different ideas about what that means. And I studied that, we did that about four or five weeks ago talking about that. But it's interesting that we need to bring it up because it's, there, there were problems in the church. Next slide, Tyler. Have you turned? Have you turned from the Word of God? Is it still about God or is it about a church attendance? Is it about doing the deeds? Is it it's about uh, bringing people to church? Is it about serving in the church? There's all these different things that we do in church sometimes that uh, we're doing it in self, sort of like what we talked about a little bit this morning. I, 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 I. I mean, it, it, it perfect setting for the lesson following up from our Bible study time. Are we doing it ourselves? Or are we doing it in the Spirit? Do we do it for God? Um, Revelation 3, 1b, The angel of the Lord of the church of Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. What's your deeds? On the outward expression, on the outward thing, 
a lot of times when people are working, 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 working in the church, they're just doing it to be seen. They're doing it to be recognized. And that's what it says you've done well. You're alive in your practices. You, you're doing good. I'm not picking on anybody. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Mark a little bit, okay? But I'm not really trying to pick. But Mark cuts the grass. He weed eats. He, anytime I need something done here at the church, he does it, okay? Because I'm not able anymore. And he'll be the first one to say, I'll take care of it, okay? Now, we get behind. The drain was stopped up. I went over and got mud and got all muddy the Wednesday night that we found it running out in the floor. But he came over the next week and dug it out and got it done. Now, he didn't do it as a deed, but there are people in the church that do things as deeds to make them look good. There are people in the church that give money to make them look good. We went to a church one time that uh, a man in the church told the pastor one time, well, you just don't know how much money I give. Now, was he giving it out of love for the church or was he doing it to make himself look good? See what I'm talking about? That happens. It happens in the church. Do you just don't know how much money I give? You know what the preacher told him? No. He said, God don't need your money. God don't need your money. See, we can get so caught up, and, and I said it in the morning, this morning, and everybody agreed. We all, whether we want to agree with it or not, we have an I mentality. I did this. I did that. We did this. It's not I. It's not me. It's not we. God did it through us. But we're humans, and we mess up. God did it through us. I can't put my shoes on in the morning without God's help. It's just as easy. I could wake up in the morning and not be able to walk. When we were younger, uh, I would get up in the morning and my legs would clap, collapse underneath me. God put spring back in my step. God wakes me up every morning. God has given, allow me to stand in the pulpit today. I don't feel like it, but I'm here. God allows me to do everything that I do on a daily basis. And I need to, although I give Him credit, I need to give Him more credit. Does that make sense? Because sometimes I slip into it. But that's not what this church had. They didn't have Christ. They were unregenerated. They had been in the church. They had walked down that aisle. They had done whatever they did back then. But they had strayed and walked away from God. And that's what it says. The second part of that verse says, but you are dead. You're dead. What's dead mean? You're not regenerated. You're not a child of God. You're going to die and go to hell. That's what dead means. You're going to die and go to hell. What it literally means is you are dead. You have turned from the truth. Sometimes we lose our impact, even our witness, because we turn away. I know preachers that have walked away from the church. Not just walk away from the pulpit, but walked away from the church. They were good preachers, but they started doing it in their self instead of for God, and they got discouraged. We start doing things even in the church, in the flesh, and we're dead. Revelation 3, 2. A good verse. All of them are good, but this one really hits home. Wake up. You need to wake up and see what you're doing. You need to wake up and see where God's leading you. See what God wants you to do. And strengthen the things that remain. You strengthen them. You lean on Christ a little bit harder. You trust God a little bit more. Which we're about to die. 
if you turn from God, okay, God might take you out a little early. Or if you turn for God in the church, the church will die. The church will eventually die. For I have not found your deeds complete in my sight. Why did you not find them complete? Because they weren't doing them for God. They were doing them for their self. They were doing it for their own recognition. Wake up here means, though, pay attention to the need of your own salvation and stop being careless about your relationship with God. Sometimes we all get careless about our relationship. When we start to slip, we sometimes lose sight of not only God, but family and all of those around you. When you really start messing up, when you start, even Christians, when they start messing up, when they start turning away, when they start not following God as close as they're supposed to, things will start happening to them. Things will start going bad, wrong. Because we need to wake up. Strengthen the things that remain. Think about what you got, what got you where you're at. Think about who you are in Christ. Think about your relationship with Christ. Or do you have one? Sometimes I know people, we all know people, you ask them about if they're children of God or they're Christians or whatever how you ask. And they say, well, I got saved when I was six years old or 12 years old. Well, what have you done since then? What have you done since you got saved? Well, uh, 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 uh. In other words, you ain't done nothing. Are you sure that you really accepted Christ when you was that age? Because if you're a Christian, you're going to do what God wants you to do. And you're going to walk with Him. You're going to stay close to Him. Think about where you are. The next part says, which were about to die. Physical. You might die physically. It might be a spiritual death. It might be material. You might lose everything. You might lose your house, your home. You can lose everything. Your family or even death. When I walked away in my life, I knew I was a Christian, but I was tired of living and I prayed that God would let me die. Instead, God had another plan for me. Why did I do that? Because I wasn't living the life God had called me to. And we can all say that. All of us can say that unless you're that perfect Christian and there's no such thing. Okay? But all of us try to think that we're so perfect that I do this and this and this and this and this. We're not perfect. We're only perfect in the blood, but not in our life. And then the last part of that verse was not found. Do you have a spiritual impact in life? That's what it means. What is your spiritual as what is your spiritual impact? Mark's little thing this morning where he got teary eyed. Woman wasn't a Christian. And that's the first time you told me that. I didn't, I have not heard that story. Okay? Well, I can't remember, Mark. I can't remember yesterday, okay? I know, but, you know, the thing is, is he had a spiritual impact. What kind of spiritual impact do you have with unbelievers? Or do they say, well, they call themselves a Christian? Or, you know, that's the most hateful Christian I ever met in my life. Think about it. I know some of those people. Or one guy that preaches the gospel all the time and follows it up with cuss words. That's not being a Christian. That's not living the life Christ has called us to live. If you're going to be a Christian, you need to make an impact in people's lives. 
but you're not found. You had lost your spiritual Im impact. Revelation 3, 3. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at the what hour I will come to you. Remember. Remember what brought you there. I, you know, I think a lot of my salvation because I got saved early in life. And I can remember the time of the day, and not the date day, but I can remember the night. And I think about that a whole lot. Why do I think about it? Because it keeps me in check. Because there's a number of times in my life that I wasn't thinking about it, and I walked away. So what will keep you in check when you remember things. I also remember the things that I screwed up in. Sorry. I also remember those things. And I pray every day that God will keep me from screwing up again. I said it again, Sam. I'm sorry. Plug your ears, Erica. We all mess up. We all make mistakes on a daily basis. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But we need to strive for perfection. We need to strive to be the people that God's called us to be. Um, that was so remember. Revelation 2.5 Remember from where you have fallen and repent. I did that a couple of weeks ago. Remember where you have fallen and repent. Second part of that. Do the deeds you did first. Do what brought you to salvation. Do what you were doing to keep you close to God. And quit messing up. Because when we start doing it, me, 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 or I, 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 you're going to mess up. Last part of that verse. Or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. If you don't turn, you'll face judgment. That's what the Bible says. If you don't turn back, unless you repent, you'll face judgment. If you're a believer, the judgment will be here on earth. You understand that? Why can I say that? Because I'm a child of the King, and at the second coming, I will not have to face judgment. Jesus says, Father, that's my child. I died for him. I will not have to face that judgment. But if you're a non-believer, it's an eternal judgment. You might have to pay for it here on earth, but you'll pay for it for the rest of your life. Because you die, you're still going to be alive. You're still going to be alive. You're going to be burning in hell. The Bible says where the worm does not die, going to be burning, burning, burning. What are you, and, and I know some that don't believe in a literal fire. They don't believe that the Bible's correct when it says burning. Well, I do. What you have received, literal nets, how did you receive it? What did you receive, but how did you receive it? You received it only by the grace of God. You received it only by accepting Jesus Christ. You heard it, you listened, and you took action. Many people hear it, but they don't listen. But more people don't take action. They'll sit in pews for 
20, 30, 40 years and die and go to hell because they did their deeds. That because, remember the first part of that? I know your deeds. They did their deed. They did what they thought was expected of them except for accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. Repent. Turn back. Repent means about face. You turn from the way you were going. Jim knows the about face probably better than anybody in this church. You turn from going this way and you turn around 100%. It's not a quarter of a turn. It's not a half turn. It's an about face. You change directions when you accept Christ. It says if you don't wake up, I'll come back and get you. Revelation 2.5. I just did Revelation 2.5 just a few minutes ago. So, you have a decision to make. If you're a non-believer, you need to repent and ask Jesus to come into your heart. If you're a believer and not living the life God's called you to, you need to repent before judgment falls on you here on earth. Then the Bible says, I'll come like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord is, will come just like a thief in the night. Why does it say that? Because we don't know when He's coming back. We don't know. Not, the Bible says not even the Son of Man Himself knows when He's coming back. The Son of Man is God, or Jesus. Second Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Heavens will pass away with roar and elements, will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now John 10.10, 10, that's the verse I first thought about when uh, I was preparing this. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal kill and destroy. They want to kill you. They want to steal your joy. And they want to destroy you. That's what the world wants to do to us. That's what Satan wants to do to us. He wants to throw things at us, obstacles at us, that cause us to slip, to cause us to turn, to cause us to walk away. But the last part of that verse says, I have come that you might have life. Life here on earth. To provide, provide for you, take care of you. But the second part of that verse is, and have it abundantly. When will we have abundant life? Not here on this earth. You might think that because you got money in the bank, you might think because you got farms and homes and all that stuff, it's an abundant life. But it's all going to burn up today, one day. It's all going to burn up. You ain't gonna, there's never going to be a U-Haul behind a hearse. Never. If it is, it ain't going to do no more good anyway, right? But there will be an abundant life in heaven. Last part of that verse was, What hour I come to you. Be sure of this. If the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been alert. See, we don't know. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We just know He is. I can remember when I was a younger man, my dad talked to me all the time about Jesus is coming back. Son, it's going to be this year. It's going to be this year. It's going to be this year. You know how many years I've heard that? All my life. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. But we know He is coming back. Thank you, Erica. We know He is coming back. So we have to be ready. You don't want to be caught living in sin when He comes. You don't want to be caught doing the things that you know are not pleasing to God. Because He's still going to come. And you're not going to stop it. 
Number three, slide three. Are you standing firm? Are you standing firm on your, on your convictions? Are you standing firm on the Word of God? Because some convictions aren't right. Some people have convictions that are wrong, especially in today's world. <laughs> I love it, Erica. I wish I had more people that would do that every once in a while. She's going to be my new amen corner. I'm going to let her start sitting right there every Sunday. Yep. <laughs> Revelation 3, 4. I've opened up an animal. <laughs> but you have a few people in Sardis who have sold their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. What's he saying? There were a few people left in the church that hadn't lost their first love. There were a few people in the church that were still trying to keep the church going. Most of them weren't. We all know people that have even, even in struggles of life, they stand. We all know those people. I hope I'm one of them. I've tried my best to be one that has stood with all the stuff, garbage going on. Because if the preacher gets down in the dumps, the whole congregation gets down in the dumps. But I'm not perfect. I just try to do what God's led me to do. It is not them, but God. See, I said the I thing again, didn't I? It's habit. It's habit. But it's in my notes right here. It's not me, but God. So see, I recognize who it is. But sometimes old self gets in the way. It's God in me. God in them. That's Revelation eleven thirteen. When the world seems to crash in on you, you're terrified, you still need to praise God. You still need to put God first in your life. I can remember when I had my surgery, my heart stents put in. I cried when I came out. Because for the first time in about seven months, I could sing. I could lift my voice up. Because God had done a work in me. My kids and my wife thought I was dying. But God wasn't ready for me. God had a plan. And I'm going to live the rest of my life trying to fulfill that plan. Not sold. What's sold mean? Dirty. Polluted. Stained. You know what it really is? It's your character. It's your actions. Do you call yourself a Christian and live like the devil? Do you call yourself a Christian and act like the devil? Do you call yourself a Christian and, and uh, say bad words all the time? No. Uh, it's, a difference in, it's a difference in saying it accidentally, but making it a habit. That's a difference. There's nothing that frustrates me more than a person that calls himself a Christian that, can't, that has a dirty mouth. The Bible calls it filthy luger. Do you stand? Are you faithful? Jude 23 says, Save others, snatch them out of the fire. Is your life in a way that you can present the gospel to people and them accept Christ and take them out of the fire. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. We have to live that life. We have to live that life on a daily basis. Next part, they will walk with me. Putting God first. Think of God first. What He's done for you. Second, who you were. Who'd you used to be? 
And where are you today? That's hard for me sometimes because I got saved at such a young age. But it's not hard. Because just because I got saved at a young age, I didn't always live that life I was supposed to live. I messed up hundreds of times. All naming, carrying the name of Christ. First time I messed up was about 16 years old. That I really can identify. Not saying I've never messed up before that but that I can really identify at 16 years old. And then again at 17, and then again at 20, and then again at 25. See, I was chasing the wrong thing in life. I wasn't putting God first in my life. I was chasing everything but God. What is your walk? I was on the success train. God blessed me, but I was not living for Him. But you know what happened? Where do you turn in crisis? Every time I messed up and it was starting to cost me something or, or cause problems, you know what I did? I turned to Him in a crisis. I turned back to Jesus, and as soon as it got settled, guess what I did? I, I did it about face, but I did it in the wrong reason. What do you put first in your life? How do you live your life? Matthew 6, one of my favorite verses. It's on my shirts. I've got it written everywhere. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Can you finish it, Erica? Seek you first the kingdom of God? Yes. Finish it. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Yep. When you put God first, He's going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. In white, for they were worthy. That's part of that verse. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That doesn't mean you're spotless, sinless here on earth, but it means that you have a perfect Savior that when you die, you're going, all your sins are going to be forgiven. You've already been forgiven. Excuse me. Isaiah 118 says, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like pure wool. I've never seen, and I can be wrong, but I've never seen a sheep with black wool. No. I've always seen them with white. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there some? I don't know. I know goats are, but I've never seen a sheep with one. They do like sheep. Hmm? They do like sheep. Okay, I didn't know that. But I've never seen one. But what it's talking about is white as wool. Revelation 19.8. 19, 8. Clothed herself in fine linen, bright and clean, and the fine linen of righteous acts of the saints. Are we clean? What does, what does a bride... Most of the time where? A white robe. Why? It represents purity. That's what white represents is purity. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who comes is a reference to Revelation 2.4. And when it talks about, he who overcomes, I'm sorry, it talks about overcoming. Do you, are you an overcomer? Do you overcome temptations most of the time? Because all of us slip. All of us make mistakes. 
Revelation 3.21 says, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me. Do you want to sit with Jesus? Do you want to sit with Jesus? Do you want to sit at Jesus' feet? You're going to have to overcome to sit at His feet. It says, sit with me on my throne in Revelation. I also, I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. Where are you going to be? I will not erase Him. Oh, before I do that, I will not erase His name. We've studied in Revelation the end times a lot over the last couple of weeks. And sometimes, and I've said it in there, that I used to worry about having to face all of my sins that I had committed here on earth. I believe that those sins that I've done as a Christian are judged here on earth. Because I believe when I get to heaven, I won't be judged for those sins anymore. There's two books. The Lamb's Book of Life and the Book of Judgment. Which book is your name written in? Are you a believer? The devil believes, so let me say it differently. Do you follow Christ? Do you trust Christ for everything? There's a bunch of references about that. There's too many to even list. But the book, you have to really read the book of Revelation to understand what the book is. But the passage there says, I will not erase his name. See, if you're a child of God, your name's written down. It means you're secure. It means eternal security. It means sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's what all of those verses mean. But if your name's not there, that's non-believers. It says in Exodus 32, 32, all the way back to the Old Testament, second book in the Bible. But now if you will forgive their sin, and if not... You're either going to be forgiven of your sin or not be forgiven of your sin. The ones that are not are the non-believers. Please blot me out of your book, which you've written. Which book is your name written in? Psalm 69, 28 says, May they be blotted out of the book of life. But then Luke 1020 says, but rejoice, your name's recorded in heaven. Your name's recorded in heaven because you've accepted Christ. Last part of that verse, I will confess his name. Matthew 10 32. I will confess your name, him now, I confess him before my father. What that's talking about. What that's saying is, is when you're sitting in heaven, there's two books there. And Jesus, your, your name pops up, you pop up, whatever, how it's going to work. I don't know how it's going to work. I just have to think about it, how, what the Bible says. Your name comes up, you're sitting in front of God, and God's opening the book. And Jesus says, Father, that's my child. I died for him. I died for him. You know what happened then? Enter enter into heaven. Enter into a life of abundance with me. Luke 12, 12, 8 says, I say to everyone who confesses me before men, that the Son of Man will confess Him also before the angels of God. Jesus will proudly 
no matter what sin has been in your life in the past, if you're a child of His, your sins are forgiven and He will profess you to His Father. Revelation 3, 6 ends like so many other verses have ended. ended. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's a reason that we're going through this. There's a reason that we did Daniel this morning. There's a reason that we're doing Revelation now because we need to make sure that everybody that we can, family, friends, and otherwise, gets to go to heaven with us. We can't make them go. We can't make them accept Christ. We can't do anything except for pray and live it in front of them. Listen to God's Word. Depend on it and follow it and talk about it. Live the life that God's called us to live. And sometimes our attitude is what keeps people from following us as believers.